This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 871, recorded on February 22nd, 2022. That's right, it's 2-22-22 today. Ooh, <laughs> I'm Vincent Raganiello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is yucky weather here. It's um, it's a little warmer than it has been. It's 41 Fahrenheit, 5 Celsius, but we've got light drizzle and overcast and uh, one of those wet, cold mm. days. It's, it's interesting. It's 12 Celsius here oh. and, and raining. It warmed up. Yeah. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello. Uh, my weather stands in stark contrast to Alan's. <laughs> uh, I just came in from uh, pulling some weeds. It is 85 degrees outside and sunny. Uh, it's going to be, but that's not going to last. It's going to be 40 tonight. Tomorrow the high is going to be 44 and then it's going to freeze for a couple of nights. Wow. Uh, this is a crazy town yep. weather-wise. Ping pong weather. Yep. Well, uh, here at the incubator, I bought myself a a water boiler so I could make tea and I have uh -huh. tea. But look, look at this mug that <laughs> I was given. They call me Nutrafil because I slay all day. <laughs> 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 so this is from from uh, Dania who uh, took my virology course at Columbia uh, uh, last year and uh, has, has been moderating our live streams. It really belongs on immune, but I thought- That's good. I would make my tea. So I have some- some tea to keep the, uh, the the throat clear, you know, is right. a podcast. What kind of tea? Mm -mm. Uh, it is um, Trader Joe's mint tea. Ah. My daughter was just here. I have my daughter come every two weeks to clean the place up. <laughs> Va vacuum and wash. <laughs> I, pay, I, I, pay, I paid her to do it, but she, she enjoys coming into the city. <laughs> and... Um, I sent her to Trader Joe's. I said, get me some some tea and uh, yogurt. And she brought me this because she knows I like these. These are amazing. Trader Joe's soft black licorice twist. Oh, oh if you haven't had these, it's going to be this week in candy. Yeah. <laughs> this, this week in food. Ooh, those are good, but very addictive. I'm not a big licorice fan, but uh, Laura is. Me neither. I'm not. I'm not. No. La Laura is definitely into one. it. I'll have to. Well, she she also is a Trader Joe's fan, so I'm sure she's familiar with those. That being said, one of the things that routinely falls into my cart at Trader Joe's, I don't know how they get there, but it's those uh, chocolate-covered caramels. Ah. Yeah, they're good. Let yeah, me show good. you what these, these look like. I mean, these are these are some – look look at this thing. <laughs> it's a, yeah. It's yeah. quite a thick well, – Looks is, like a piece of rebar. Yeah. So this – yeah, it does look like rebar. This is not the one I was thinking of. <laughs> There's one that's uh, even, even blacker and more uh, crusty looking, but this is not it. It's fine. I mean, I don't really – eat that much, but now and then it's nice to pop one in for a little extra energy. All right. A uh, couple of announcements. The annual biomedical research conference for minority students, Abercams, is launching a new meeting. The Abercams e-poster spring symposium for emerging scientists. This is for high school students who've conducted research, community college students, and first-year undergrads who present research in one of the 12 Abercams disciplines. The meeting is held online Saturday, April 23rd, 2022. And will help students prepare and qualify for subsequent Abercams participation in the fall meeting. Abstracts are due March 15th. In addition, Abercams wants to promote the professional development of early career scientists by encouraging grad students and postdocs to sign up to be abstract reviewers and judges. Although all active researchers are eligible to volunteer, Abercams 22 will be no oh, November 9th through 12th in Anaheim. And more details on that in the spring. In addition, ASV registration is now open. The abstracts are due March 1st. Travel grant applications for students, postdocs, and teachers of undergraduate virology are due March 3rd. Applications for ASV CARES grants are available for members to support dependent care at home or elsewhere. During the meeting, on-site daycare will be available for members. Details to be announced very soon, but it's similar to what was planned for the 2020 ASV meeting at Colorado State, which didn't happen. And the 2022 is, meeting is a hybrid meeting, right? So it's going to be... People yeah, can attend virtually right. or they can attend in person. Mm -hmm. Correct. ASV.org. You can see links to the to the meeting. 
And finally, the Department of Micro and Immunology at LSU Health, Health in Shreveport, Louisiana State University, would like to encourage people interested in pursuing grad studies in the fall of 2022 to apply to their master's and PhD deep programs. They are a vibrant department of 16 faculty members working on a variety of DNA and RNA viruses, innate immunology, intracellular bacteria like Bordetella and Legionella. They are in Northwestern Louisiana and offer unique opportunities to grow personally and professionally mild winters and Southern hospitality. Deadline for applications, March 1st. Check out the department website. There's a link in the show notes. And I just want to point out- Is just, Dennis uh, O'Callaghan still chair there? I don't know if he is, but that's where he was, right? Yeah, forever. A long time. Uh, I'll check out. I'll check out this link. Go ahead. I wanted to point out that the three of us. Uh, this is like old, old school old twiv. twiv. Uh, in the old days. Yeah. So Dixon and I started, and then it was clear that. Well, I actually wanted to add uh, Alan because I thought a science writer's perspective would be interesting, but also Dixon uh, was not that committed back then, and Alan and I did a bunch of episodes together. Right? Yep. Uh, and then Rich came in. So the three of us did a bunch of episodes whenever Dixon bowed out. And then Kathy joined There's us. There's even one uh, back in the archives that's Brianna. just Rich and me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Is that the, the Invincible, Invincible Twiv? Twiv. Yep. The Invincible Twiv. I think there may have been more than one. There, there may uh, have been. V v Invincible Twivs. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try and go away uh, this summer for a week, and maybe you guys could do another sure. one. Sure. If you're motivated. Sure. That would be fun. Uh, when I, it's interesting when I think about those times, although this was not necessarily that frequent, the picture that comes to mind is podcasting from Oregon. Oh, yeah. That's right. I, a couple of episodes I did from from, uh, from Oregon. And I think, you know, there was one about, uh, it was uh, fish flu. Right. Yeah, it was one of the flu. early ones. I don't know if that was just the three of us. I think it probably was. Yeah. Yeah. And back then yeah. it was, um, we couldn't see each other. We were just on Skype. No. Yeah, yeah we, did, we did that for a long time, just yeah, I yeah. think until uh, 2019, really, yeah. through 2019. And then as soon as we went, went home for the pandemic, um, we switched to Zoom, yep. right? Yep. And the reason was that the way I had Skype set up, everyone was connected on their own computer. So I had four computers in my office, and each one brought in a different Skype person. I couldn't duplicate that at home, uh, so we switched to Zoom. And uh, I, I now, of course, we're away from Zoom because there are other better things. But uh, it's it's just interesting how the technology has evolved to get better podcasting. The uh, chair of the LSU Department of Microbiology and Immunology is now Martin Sapp. Okay. So uh, that makes sense. Dennis had a long run. <laughs> I think probably too long, but... I mean, I think chairs should be 10, 15 years max, probably. Oh, they've got him. Uh, he's, uh, Dennis is uh, here listed as a professor emeritus. Okay. Makes sense. You're Good. an emeritus professor, right? I am indeed. That's why I introduce you as all the time, or at the end, yep. yeah. And it actually comes with a couple of perks. Yeah. Uh, you know, parking, I don't use that. <laughs> uh, mostly uh, the library which I do uh, electronically, is indispensable. And I've discovered, oh, I get a subscription to the New York Times. Oh. And for anyway. those of you who might think nice. that the, uh, for those of you who might think that that uh, reflects a uh, left-leaning trend <laughs> in the University of Florida, I could also have a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so we're balanced. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, most importantly, I've discovered, uh, I've got a zoom account. Okay. Mm. That's, you know, a robust mm. university yeah, yeah. zoom account. So very good. All those things are good. Yeah, it's all good. I don't think, no, we don't get any subscriptions. Not to mention, uh, allegiance to the university of Florida. <laughs> right. I think we get lifetime subscriptions because we, we keep our uni, our, our email address, but. We don't get New York Times uh, or anything else. You know, you have to apply to be emeritus. I'm not sure anyone's going to go out of their way to do it for me, so I'm not going to push it. it I'll apply matter. for you. No, it has to be somebody. It has to be my chairman. Oh, your chairman? <laughs> yeah, the chairman has to apply, and I'm just not sure he would do it. Oh, yeah, come on. Yeah, we'll see. 
He'll say, have Steve, Vincent, have Steve go to your chair and turn the screws. Yeah. Vincent, he, he said, Vincent, you didn't bring in enough grant money in my <laughs> tenure. <I'm sorry. laughs> well, I brought a lot of fame to the university, I think, because a lot of people yeah. recognize it. Yeah. And say, you know, if I'm emeritus, then I'll be around less. <laughs> That's right. All right. We have a snippet in a paper for you today. Today is uh, COVID-19 day. <laughs> we have a comment in uh, Nature Reviews Microbiology, which is which is very timely for us, towards SARS-CoV-2 serotypes, question mark, by Etienne Simon Laurier and Olivier Schwartz uh, from the uh, Institut Pasteur. Um, so they start by saying a serotype is defined as a variation within a microbial species distinguished by the antibody response. And that, that this serotype, as Amy said a couple of weeks ago, she talked about serotype. This definition was established before modern technology, way before modern yes. technology. Before we could do stuff like neutralization tests in a laboratory, right? Yeah, we. I think Amy said it was defined for polio in animals, whether an animal was you infected with an isolate and then you came back and infected with another. And if, if uh, they were protected, it was the same ter- serotype. And you're measuring disease in that case because there was no good way to yeah. measure infection. Uh, but then then they go ahead, they extend it, and they say antibodies gener- generated to one serotype do not usually efficiently protect against another. Uh, and it's not complete, though. There is some cross-reactivity among serotypes. It's not absolute, I should say. Right. Do they use the word protect? Yes. They yes. do. I do. Hmm. I mean, I, you could do that in cells and culture. I don't know if, if anyone does that. This, is a, the, this whole discussion is really nuanced. <laughs> yes. It is. It is. And the vocabulary <laughs> is really important. Yeah, so the, As a matter of fact, the whole discussion is about vocabulary. Yes, it really is. Because a serotype, <laughs> a serotype was defined before we knew most of what we know now about, yeah, I right. mean, and our knowledge of the immune system is still incomplete, of course, but if you look at, at as Vincent was saying, with polio or, you know, there are a number of other viruses where I have different serotypes, and it's just, okay, if you have three serotypes of polio virus, it means that if you've had one of them, you can still get one of the other two, was the kind of the functional yeah. definition of it. And not all viruses have serotypes, no. so... There are no influenza serotypes. There are no HIV serotypes. But there are some that, that have uh, measles exists as one serotype. They do say here in coronaviruses, there are serotypes. Feline coronavirus has two serotypes. Okay. Uh, See, this sentence, antibodies generated to one serotype <laughs> do not usually efficiently protect against another serotype. Um, uh, uh, one could say, and I'm not saying that this is true, but one could say, one might be inclined to say antibodies generated uh, to one serotype do not usually efficiently cross-react yes. against another serotype. And the point I want to make is that I think those are two different things. Yes. Okay? Yeah, and are. that's how nuanced the Protection discussion is. Protection is an in vivo question. Cross-reactivity yes, so, yes. can be determined in vitro. And, uh, right. And, cross, and, and the in vitro assay does not necessarily, as we've discussed many times before, as we discuss correlates of protection, the in vitro assay does not necessarily tell you what's going yes. on in vivo. And then they go on to say that serotypes generally correspond to genotypes. So many, I mean, there are, many viruses are classified by genotype. You take the, the genome sequence and you were part of it. Now that we can sequence build, genomes, yes. Yeah, and you build a phylogenetic tree. But I'm not sure you could look at a gene, se- a viral gene genome sequence and say this is a new serotype, right? That, in my mind, is the most interesting thing about this whole paper, okay? And uh, by paper, comment. Yes. Yeah. By the way, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a comment before that had supplementary data. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, it's gosh. the supplementary data that's interesting because if you do the genome comparison, Omicron doesn't necessarily pop out as a separate, as a clearly separate entity. But if you look at the um, uh, spike protein by itself, mm-hmm. it does. Okay. So Vincent, I agree with you. If you just look at a genome sequence, this doesn't necessarily look like a new serotype. But if you look at a particular part that you think is responsive 
that is enga in, engaged with the immune response, then maybe so. But of course, you're guessing there too, because you, you know, in this particular case, we think Spike is a critical player in that. But in that's not necessarily always the case that you know which protein to look at. Right. Yeah. Exactly maybe right, what yeah. you do is take if you want to use genotype to define serotypes maybe what you do is look at them one gene at a time and do the phylogeny and see if anything pops out and whether that uh if something does whether that makes sense in terms of immune response this really reminds me a lot of what's happened to taxonomy since the the gene sequencing revolution where taxonomy we used to classify organisms based on morphology based on shapes so you've take a, an insect, you take a beetle and you put it under a dissecting microscope and you count how many segments there are in each part of the antennae. And you say this beetle is a different species from this beetle because it has a different number of segments in the antenna. And then you say these species are more closely related because they have similar numbers of segments in their antennae. And then you get to the genome era and people can sequence these bugs and they they say oh well it turns out that these beetles that had similar looking antennae are actually very different at the genome level so how do we classify them um and here in virology the classical method of classifying a virus was are you immune to it if you've been infected with it and if you're not then that's a different serotype at least and if it causes the same symptoms then maybe it's the same viral species but a different serotype and then we start sequencing genomes and we say, oh, wow, these things, you know, these hepatitis viruses are totally unrelated to each other. They cause a similar disease, but they're not remotely similar at the genome level. And then serotypes, we say, okay, you have these different serotypes of viruses. Those are, in a lot of cases, very closely related to each other, but it didn't have to be that way. <laughs> right. and, it, and so part of the nuance here is, what is the most relevant factor to consider in classifying yeah. viruses? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the genome sequence, but this this concept of serotype has a role. Yes. Um, so, for example, there is one measles serotype, which is not to say there is not antigenic drift or variation within. You can find differences, but they're not enough to overcome immunity. If uh, new measles arose that could overcome pre-existing immunity, it would probably be a new serotype, I would well, guess. Well, also, something you said earlier might confuse a lot of people when you said flu mm -hmm. doesn't have serotypes. Um, but, well, why do we have to get a different flu shot every year? Well, it has, it has, they're not called serotypes. They're not serotypes, right? Because right? they're different enough that we don't think of them as being yeah. quite the same virus. But that's something that's going on at the genome level. Yeah, so for influenza, we classify into types A, B, and C. And then within A, there are subtypes like H3N2, H1N1, which don't give you cross-protection. Right. So those could be considered serotypes, but they're not called that way. Right. They're called subtypes. And then, of course, within an H3N2 or an H1N1, you have drift, which is why you reformulate the vaccine periodically, but they don't, they're not called serotypes, right? right? <laughs> well, this is why I think the word is so important in this uh, in this particular case, and flu really makes a good example because I think you need to carefully define what a serotype is because the way the way I understand it, there is some cross reactivity amongst yeah. these things, and I yes. really don't know how that actually plays out in real life in the human population. Yeah, okay, that's right. but I don't think it's a I don't think. Based on what I know, I don't think uh, the difference between Omicron and other variants is a really sharp boundary. I think it's. I think there's some fuzz there. So I don't know if you want to call it another serotype. Maybe you want to. Maybe you want to use another word, same as they do in flu. I'm not sure. I just don't know how much how relevant it is anymore with genotype. I think genotype is is sufficient, frankly. And the serotype is a holdover from an era where we didn't have the methods we have now. So, you know, this paper makes the case that Omicron should be a serotype, but I'm not sure what that would get us yeah. over uh, yeah. what we already yeah, know. Yeah, I, I take a problem is hey, I take a utilitarian uh, uh, tack, which is <clears throat> what practical difference does it make to say that this is a serotype? What does it change? And I'm not sure it really changes anything. No. As a matter of fact, it may even be confusing because serotype is such a loaded word. Yes. 
Serotype suggests such a long Serotype suggests that if you've had SARS-CoV-2 yeah, Delta yeah. variant and you get the Omicron serotype, you've got a whole new infection. But yeah. that's not the case. That's the, right. the the evidence supports that that is not the case. Well, the, the authors make a case that it would be important to, but I don't. We'll get to that at the end. But I don't really understand what their case is. But we'll get to that. Anyway, they go through Omicron. They go through the phylogenetic analysis where. For much of SARS-CoV-2 evolution, we had steady accumulation of changes uh, that gave rise to the five variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and eventually Omicron. But Omicron was quite divergent from all the others. And, and so BA1, which was the first Omicron variant uh, in November 2021, doesn't, its lineage doesn't derive from the recently circulating variants. And of course, there are also sublineages of Omicron BA one, two, and three. Um, they share some changes, and they also have some unique uh, changes as well. And there are a lot of changes in Omicron, right? Uh, Fifty-four mutations, seven in uh, insertions and deletions, compared with the original OG SARS-CoV two, and more than half of them in spike. You used that once. Yes. I like that, Alan. It's good. Um, uh, and uh, many of these changes are in the receptor binding domain. And much more in the spike than any other previous variant. Uh, and they put a, their figure is a nice phylogenetic tree of uh, the SARS CoV 2. And you can see all the other viruses, all the other isolates are in one cluster, and Omicron is, is all by itself. But importantly, that's a phylogenetic tree of the SARS CoV 2 spike protein. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, did you look at this uh, supplementary data? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the whole genome, uh, you know, Omicron is not uh, necessarily any, uh, just from a, my sort of naive uh, look at this, Omicron is not all that much more significantly variant from uh, the root Wuhan strain yeah. than, for example, Delta. Okay. Yeah. You got yeah. Alpha, Gamma, and Beta <clears throat> kind of look like a group. And then Delta, if if anything, Delta is off uh, further into space than Omicron. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you got to focus on Spike before this really pops sure. out as something yeah. different. And of course, that's where the antibody based serology is is dependent on, yeah. right? The Spike. Right. So it makes sense. So they say that these uh, differences in Spike, combined with other biological differences like. Um, well, the, the spike trimer apparently is more compact, it's more stable, um, and other changes as well. They say Omicron should be, now they introduce a new nomenclature, a strain. They a say strain, so yes. should, A strain of SARS-CoV-2. And then they say the other, the ancestral virus and the other variants, then they forget about strain. They call them serotype 1 and Omicron is serotype 2. So what is that? What is a strain? A strain is something with a unique uh, biological property. And so a serotype, I think, could be a new strain, right? A new serotype could be a new strain. Um, and that's, you know, people have thrown about strain all the time, yes. but I think here it makes sense. This is the only time it would make sense to use it for Omicron. If it's phenotypically really. different, yes. Yeah. Okay, so it says, now, if, you, if Omicron is a novel serotype, that means antibodies against ancestral viruses should not react well with it and vice versa. Antibodies against Omicron should not react with uh, ancestral viruses. And here's where it gets a little dicey. If you have two mRNA vaccinations really close together, your, your sera doesn't do well at neutralizing Omicron at all. But if you get a booster, bingo, now it's neutralized. So how... I mean, and they say that's because the third boost helps uh, generation of affinity matured improved versions of the antibodies. So would that be the case with polio no. serotypes? No. Could you eventually get that? You can, no, no matter right? how many times you're boosted with type one polio, you are not immune to type three polio. We we know that from grim experience. So this is actually a a case against it being a serotype, in my opinion. I don't yeah. know. What do, you, what do you think? I mean, well, I interestingly, <clears throat> that the phenomenon that the third shot, what we call a boost, improves the uh, 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 
antibody, I got to be careful about this, improves the serum neutralization of virus, okay? Um, the, the mechanism for that, since you're using the same immunogen, must be that you're getting maturation yeah. of antibodies to epitopes that the two viruses have in common. Yes. Okay? You're not, you're not all of a sudden getting antibodies to the Omicron-specific epitopes. Right. Okay? That even makes it more confusing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But from a, from a, a biological definition, I agree with you, Vincent, the, uh, that the fact that the boost brings you back up to snuff um, complicates the issue significantly. Yeah, for, as, and, as and they said, also they point out that the reciprocal experiment: if you're immune to o Omicron, what does your profile look against the ancestral strains? We don't have, we really don't have data other than some animal data for that yeah. one, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, the, it, what if it's half? What if you make you you immunize with Omicron and you poorly neutralize other? It's okay. So that's part of the serotype definition, but it has to go both ways, I would think. Yeah. Uh, they seem to think so, and I would agree. Anyway, they but they say <clears throat> Omicron is thus particularly unsensitive to antibodies elicited against prior variants, but no, it depends whether you get a third dose or not. Yes. Right? Or if you've been, uh, if you've gotten two doses and been infected or those in some other order. Yeah. So I, for for this reason, I think don't call it a new serotype. I think you're right, Vincent. I, I'm I with you. I don't think it's worth it. Yeah. Well, I think it's just, maybe you want to call it a strain if you agree on the biological phenotypes and so forth, but not a not a serotype. And in fact, they end up saying at the end, the last paragraph, boundaries of each serotype may be difficult to establish. Yeah. And they say exactly. a serotype may really be a continuum of immune escape and immunodominance. So I think that makes more sense. And as we understand antibody responses, that's yeah. reality, right? I think the analysis of the viruses and the discussion is a worthy discussion. And I learned something from reading the paper. And I like the analysis yes. of the, yes. the this uh, phylogenetic analysis of the Omicron spike relative to the others. And it's uh, the thought, the, the, the degree of cross-reactivity is thought-provoking. But the word serotype, as I said before, I just think is too loaded. You got to think of maybe a new word. Yes. Okay. I think the phenomenon, Omicron is different. Okay. In some ways. Okay. And it's different. It's consequentially different. Yes. I think. Okay. Uh, so that's important. But uh, I think the vocabulary, we got to be careful with the vocabulary. I'm, I'm actually okay with calling Omicron a strain. I. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've, I've been reluctant too. to apply that to earlier variants of concern because the evidence for them being phenotypically different was kind of all over the map. But with Omicron, we do see something different. I mean, we see yeah. we see something that appears to be, if I may say, attenuated to some extent. Um, now that's you know not comfort comforting to the people who ended up in the hospital or or worse with. Omicron infection, but the the percentage of that seems to be significantly lower. And I think that's worth calling out and saying, okay, this is different. But serotype, no, I think, as Rich said, that's a loaded word. It implies that your prior immunity is no good anymore. And that's definitely not the case with Omicron. Right. Yep. And then they close by saying, making two serotypes should facilitate surveying the evolution of the pandemic and tailoring of diagnostic treatment and prevention tools. I don't know why you need serotype to no, do that, right? No, it's just, no. It doesn't make sense to me. So, I mean, this is their opinion, yes. right? That's fine. They're yeah, entitled. Fine. And it's a thought-provoking discussion. It that's is. good. Yes. I think that's and it's well-written. They describe the whole thing well. I'm just not convinced of the vocabulary. Yeah. So, I, I thought that would be fun to talk yes, about. Yes, and, and it was. And, and it comes <laughs> just after we spoke about serotypes, which... yeah. Probably well, I mean, uh, through this whole discussion, our previous one about polio and this discussion, I'm learning a lot more about serotype, yeah. what it is. And I'm learning a lot more about uh, sort of the difference between Omicron and these uh, and other viruses. It's uh, interesting. We're all learning. I mean, would anybody have anticipated any of this stuff at the beginning of this? No, no, no. of course not. If you said you no. would, it's, you're lying, but no. Right. <laughs> But that's the beauty of science, yep. right? Yep. You're always surprised. That's why it's a cool field. 
All right. So uh, now we have a paper. And and now, I mean, this is a, re re a reviewed paper. It's published cell reports. Now we're starting to see more and more peer-reviewed papers come out. I'm shying away from the preprints because I don't think we need to look look at those until they're reviewed because yeah. I think a lot of them have some issues and um, I, I want to have that fixed. This one has been peer-reviewed and published. Mutations that adapt SARS-CoV-2 to mink or ferret do not increase fitness in the human airway. And I love the fitness word appearing yes. in, uh, in yes. titles, right? We were talking about fitness over a year ago. Um, so this is by Zhao Peacock Brown. Oh, there are a lot there of four authors. first Sorry. authors. Sorry. Um, Zhao, uh, Zhi Zhao, Thomas Peacock, Jonathan Brown, and Daniel Goldhill. Okay. Right. And then Wendy Barkley is the corresponding author. And Wendy has been on TWIV many years ago, along with uh, uh, Ron Fouché. And also we have buried in here uh, Massimo Palmieri, Palmarini, sorry, who was also on TWIV uh, when I visited Glasgow. Uh, who else is on here? So they're, they're at the Imperial College London, Purbright Institute, University of Liverpool, the Glasgow Center for Virus Research, the State Serum Institute in Denmark, and the University of Oxford, and uh, the Infectious Diseases Horizontal Technology Center in Singapore. Hey, Star. Hey, Star. And so th this is addressing an issue that arose over a year ago. We're finally getting the data. Yes. So that's how long it takes, folks. You're not going to solve problems the minute you hear what's going on. Uh, so remember- you can have it fast, uh, right, cheaper, so, good, pick two. Yeah. Back in April, 2020, there were uh, re what are called either reverse zoonoses or zoo anthroponoses, where humans give viruses to, to non-human animals. Uh, of SARS-CoV-2 on mink farms in the Netherlands, U.S., France, Spain, Denmark, Italy, Sweden, Canada, Greece, Lithuania, and Poland. Um, so from farm workers who were infected, they infected the, uh, the mink and then the virus transmitted among the mink. Uh, and of course, those, I think we did one or two of those yeah. papers yeah. describing and it also, the And it also uh, spilled outbreak. back from the mink into yeah. the people um, and into local communities. And there were outbreaks of these these distinct yeah. variants in those areas. I, I had either forgotten or never fully understood the extent of that spillback. Yes. And it was not trivial. No. They say large-scale outbreak, they, they're talking about one particular outbreak, resulted in an estimated 4,000 mm. mink-associated human cases. Yes. And prompted the Danish government to uh, cull 17 million farmed mink in the country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that's significant. Yeah, I, I I did not appreciate the extent of that spillback. Yeah, and they so the far, farm workers pick it up from the mink yep. and then they bring it out into the community. Right, but none of those were uh, very few, if any of those were serious infections. Is that correct? It's my understanding. I think that's correct. Yeah, and and today we're going to see possibly why. Right. And that, that now, cluster in Denmark, um, there could have been other clusters like it in other places, but the one in Denmark was very well characterized. It was it was identified early, and they were able to test it and trace it quickly. And uh, it didn't, uh, apparently, did not spread efficiently from humans to other humans. Right. So we, it's not like we got an outbreak of this thing in humans. We, we never got the mink strain, whatever Greek letter that would have been given, um, yeah, that's right. Popping out and, and spreading worldwide. It never really got far from the farms. Right. I don't even know, we'd have to look this up, whether there was documented human-to-human -human transmission of the mink strains. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, for having 4,000, yeah, I, I suspect there, there I think there was. Some, right? I, think that, I think that those outbreaks actually had chains that did not involve people working at the mink farm. So during the uh, infection of mink, some changes in the spike were noted by sequence analysis, uh, and particularly in the in the receptor binding domain uh, Y four fifty three F tyrosine four five three to phenylalanine and N five zero one T asparagine five zero one three anine, uh, and then later on, uh, 
there was another variant identified in mink, and this is a good name, the Cluster the 5 Cluster 5 variant. variant. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm thinking. Was it a cluster? Yeah. <laughs> Um, several cha additional changes. It was a deletion of amino acids 69 to 70 in the N-terminal domain, and then a couple of amino acid changes in the S2 subunit of the spike. And there were some suggestions that there might have been, I remember early on, it said maybe there are antigenic changes, maybe right. uh, antibodies from people who are uh, less able to neutralize. So these are things we're going to address here uh, in this paper. Now, in addition... We need to talk about ferrets. So ferrets and mink are in the family Mustelidae. Weasels. And um, apparently they're very closely related. Yep. Um, they look kind of similar too. Cool. They do. And for, people have ferrets as pets. So you know? morphologically and genomically, they're similar. Yeah. Um, ferrets have been used as models for, for many respiratory virus infections, in particular influenza and also SARS-CoV-2. The virus transmits among ferrets. Um, and interestingly, during infection of ferrets, several groups have reported these mink-associated spike changes, Y453F and N5012, arising in the ferrets. Hmm? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And now uh, you have to know that the ACE2, the receptor for spike of mink and ferret, are very similar. No amino acid differences in the interface between ACE2 and the spike. So it's not surprising that similar, maybe it's not surprising that similar changes arise. Okay, so that's the background you need to understand mustelids and SARS-CoV-2. So what they did is a risk assessment. Do these viruses in, in uh, mustelids pose a threat to humans uh, and uh, vaccination? Very straightforward. So they have done previously, they've infected ferrets and looked at transmission to naive co-housed animals. Four donor ferrets, they infect them, they put them in a cage with uh, other animals and uh, they see if they transmit. And if so, what happens? What are the changes that occur, if any? So, I forget, were those experiments done with this whole mink thing in mind or was that just a ferret transmission study? It was just a transmission study. Uh, Peacock et al. 2021A. Uh, let's take a look. Peacock. 2021, they knew about the minks. They By the time the paper the came out, they knew about the minks. Yeah. Yeah. 2021A. The Fearing Peacock et al. This two Peacock et al. papers. 2021A is uh, the Fearing cleavage site in the spike is required for transmission in ferrets. So maybe not related to minks, you know? Yeah. Hmm? <clears throat> so they. Uh, they infect uh, ferrets. They put them in the same cage. Uh, and then here's what happens. They're using an early isolate from 2020. And all it has is, is a, is a uh, it has 614D. Right. Which is not, it's 614DG, right? It's the ancestral. Uh, and this transmits to two out of the four ferrets uh, that are in contact with the donor. So, you know, it's contact. It's hard to know how it transmitted, but it doesn't really matter. So they recover virus from nasal wash uh, at different time points, and they, they sequence the region encoding the spike uh, receptor binding domain. So they have two transmitted virus isolates. Uh, one has N501T in the spike, and the other has a mixture of Y453F and N501T. So these are the same changes that arose in, in the mink. Right. Right. And those that those changes are uh, appear in both the donor and the contact. So so the changes the 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 donor That's was right. infected That's right. with something that did not have those changes. Those changes happened in that animal. In the first in the it's index true. case, in, if you will. In the index case and were transmitted um, to varying degrees because yeah. the the ratios of these uh, markers change depending on the experiment, but they, they were transmitted to the second animal. Yeah, so they actually do the sequencing to prove that. They actually, you know, it just occurred to me, it would be mm. interesting to look at the virus in the animals that did not transmit. It mm. would be, I yeah. wonder if the transmission is because it's those because changes, those took, changes place. took place. Right. Yeah. And so remember what's happening here is 
the, the virus stock you're using probably has a minority, a small amount of N501T, Y5, 3T, and then it's selected because it has some advantage in the ferret. And then you see it amplifying, and then you see it in the second animal. Or if as your well. stock fact, didn't it, have that, then maybe in the first cell it infected it. <clears throat> maybe yeah, the the ones that developed that mutation because the, the mutation rate's high enough. So as you say, in donor animal one, the virus rapidly gained uh, and majority N five hundred one T, and by day five, both changes were present in equal amounts. No more wild type by day five. All displaced. Very interesting. Um. In the matched contact animal, the virus population that was transmitted had a mixture of Y453F with a minority of 501T and continued to predominate. In pair number two, again, both changes detected. In that one, N501T predominated. Uh, and, um, and here's the story. This is the key here. In the initial virus inoculum, N501T was below 1% of total reads, while Y453F was not detected at all. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that implies that uh, there was at least a uh, minor signal for N501T right. in the original mm -hmm. stock. Yeah. So uh, I'm having a difficulty with the colors here. Is it uh, in the donor two bit? Um, is is the small wedge there blue or black? <laughs> uh, in other words, uh, was there any wild type at day five in the second transmission, or is Let's it all gone as well? Uh, so that color is black. It's well type at up. day five. Yeah, okay. in in donor number two. Yeah, it's black. I say black at day two also. Yeah, it's not blue. Oh the, yeah, I see. Yeah, in the contact, there's no wild type. Right, that's all blue. Okay. Well, no, it's a sliver of wild, of of black. You have to blow it up to see the sliver. Oh, of is that black. right? Okay, <laughs> it's hard to see. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right. Okay, so then they um. Looked into the uh, the GISAID database, the global initiative on sharing all influenza data, which started to accumulate SARS-CoV-2 sequence data. And they find that these changes, 501T and 453F, and in addition, 486L, which was another one they saw, um, have arisen multiple times independently in mink. So they say these must be associated with adaptation because we see it in the lab and now we're seeing it in viruses circulating in mink. Um, and they say and subsequently this Y453F has been more frequently associated with spillback from mink into humans. Spillover from bats to humans. What is this? I guess it's spillback because humans gave it to mink and then mink gave it back. So right. it's spillback, yeah. <laughs> um, so they said, let's look at Y453 more. So they isolate virus from contact number one um, and uh, the, they propagate it in Vero cells. Uh, and it's 96% Y453F and a couple of other minor variants, N501T in the wild type present less than 5%. And then there's uh, additional changes um, in the envelope gene, which is a separate membrane component uh, of the virus. All right, so um, they have now virus with that change in it. Right. And then they're going to do some experiments now. So now they have virus with Y453, 96%, uh, and then there's a little bit of N501T and uh, wild type in that. So... They intranasally inoculate four ferrets, brand new ferrets now that haven't been used before, with this uh, passage two virus. Brand new ferrets. They just bought them. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to being the used ink isn't even dry on the receipt. Yeah, no, they've not, they've not been exposed before. So they now infect ferrets with uh, either this recovered virus or the parental England 2020 virus. Right. At days one and two, the mean titer, and they're measuring uh, virus by both PCR and TCID50, right. which is great. Very good, folks. Yes, yes, they listen to TWIV. Really appreciate it. They use fitness in the title, and they do actually infectious ah, viruses. It's pushing all the right buttons. Thank you, thank you. At days one and two, the mean titer of Y453F 
of virus shed in nasal wash was much higher than that of the parental by both PCR and infect infectivity. You can see in figures 2B and C, if you're following along in your car, <laughs> no, you're not there. <laughs> you better pull over. <laughs> um, well, if your Tesla yeah, it's, is driving it's, itself, right, then you could be um, reading a paper. In trouble, you, you, I'll yeah, tell you. Yeah. Figure 2... <laughs> To B and C, yeah, in the early days, there's a difference. So day one, there's yeah. a couple of logs, and then at day two, it starts to narrow. Then beyond that, it's closer. Yeah. And so that's what they said. They said uh, there's a big difference. And then uh, both groups showed comparable patterns of fever during infection. Uh, the Y453F ferrets trended towards more weight loss. That's a, that's a statement that Kathy doesn't like yes, trending yeah. towards. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm with Kathy. that's like a non -stati non statistically significant, a significant trend, you know, that's right. Uh, and, and yeah. the reason they're using that, I think is because if you look at the box plot on, um, on this figure, I mean, the, the bars get pretty big toward the end. Yes. With the, they do. With the ferrets in question. They get big, yeah, big error so they, bars. They so you have a lot of, of variation. Lot of for the ferret. Yeah. Um, so the tighter parental virus shed and fever in parental virus infected animals approach that in the ferret infected, uh, P2 infected animals, which is the Y53F by days three to four. And they say that's probably because the parental virus is, is acquiring those changes already right. by days three to four, right? Y453 or N501T. And in fact, uh, well, they, they deep-sequenced um, virus recovered, and they show why 453 is maintained in all of them. Uh, the, the change in the e-gene is gone. So they think maybe that arose during growth of the virus from the nasal wash of the ferret in Vero cells, right? It just arose there, and now it's gone when you put it back in ferret, so probably that doesn't matter. Uh, there several other changes that were at low levels in the inoculum rapidly grew to fixation in the ferrets. And these include spike D614N and a change in the N protein and a change in NSP2. And they just don't know if... So here's, here's something we'll take apart for you. We don't know if these changes are bona fide ferret adaptations or... Mutations hitchhiking as part of a selective sweep. So if you have a genome with Y53F selective for it, can carry other stuff with it right. that may not matter. It's called a hitchhiker. Um, and, and they say 614N could um, play a role because we know D614G promotes open spike, which helps... Uh, to bind to ACE2. All right, so basically what they have shown here is that uh, Y453 is clearly uh, a change in the spike that allows adaptation uh, to, to the ferret. So let me uh, clear something up in my head here. Yeah. Uh, in these, they're infecting these ferrets with something that is predominantly or exclusively Y453. 96%. 96%. Is this thing that came out of Vero cells? Is that right? That's right. Yes. And that's why uh, it has this other uh, E gene change, right? Right. And uh, so, and they find that the, uh, the Y453F persists. Yes. The N501T, which was one of the predominant uh, mutations in the first passage experiments in particular in one of them yeah that thing does not accumulate no it doesn't it's, it's present a little bit in the beginning but yeah. it doesn't accumulate it would be interesting to see an experiment done where you start out with something that's 96 percent n501t right. and a little bit y453f yeah because the implication is that that y453f mutation is is really the ringer okay that's right that's but right, yeah. without doing a reciprocal experiment, it's it's kind of hard. It, to, it wasn't a fair uh, fight. Figure out, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, the, 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 this is not a uh, none of these are critiques of the paper because this, oh, no, this no, is no, no, no. It's just interesting. Yeah. This it's is just, tough work. It's interesting stuff, and I mean, it just goes to show uh, 
It's, not, it's never straightforward. I mean, Y453 is clear, but these other changes, you know, other things happen and that you don't expect because it's complicated to infect yeah. an animal. <laughs> All right. So um, the um, what we do know is that, uh, well, their idea now is that maybe 453, Y453F improves the interaction of spike with mustelid ACE2, right? So the idea being that the OG SARS-CoV-2 spike, I, I shouldn't say no, that, I'm sorry. No, I think, I, I, think ancestral, I originally used it as as SARS-OG to distinguish it from SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, not SARS-1, right. yeah. All right, SARS, the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 uh, doesn't bind well to the ferret, the mustelid spike, but maybe this change helps. So they're going to address this. This is a good, this is a good question. Uh, so they make. So does Y four five three F help the virus specifically at the receptor? That's right. So they make a library of <clears throat> of <laughs> excuse me lentiviruses with different spikes. So they're making pseudoviruses, and then infected uh, cells that make either human ferret rat or 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 um, no ACE two. Okay, they've engineered cells that make uh, a, a, any one of those uh, ACE2. And they say ferret and ACE2 differs from that of mink by only two amino acids that are distal to the spike interaction interface. So basically for their experiments, it's the same thing. So wild type spike, D614G, binds poorly to ferret ACE2. In these experiments, they're looking at entry of the pseudovirus. Not, not infectivity of SARS-CoV-2, but... It, it gives you a readout of the entry step, right? Then Y453F, N501T, or F486L, as well as the full cluster 5 spike, which has other changes, all improved uh, entry into human or cells producing human or ferret uh, ACE2, but not rat. So rats are not ferrets. No. Folks. No, they're not closely related at all. What's the family of uh, rats? Oh, you know, rat rats themselves are are they ratus ratus? Uh, but uh, or ratus norvegicus right. or whatever. Yeah. Are they, well, rats yeah. are rodents. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Rodentia. Rodentia. Well, a, yeah, of course. That's not a family, though. What is the? We have to know the family here. What is the family? What is family? <laughs> Of rats. That's going to give me funny results. <laughs> Murid. Uh, Muridy. Muridy, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to get that, that, that French rat in the Disney movie who was the chef, right? Uh, ratatouille, <laughs> yeah. Right. Ratatouille. All right, so these changes get get the spike to uh, bind better to uh, uh, ferret, um, human and ferret, what? Well, they, they're already good at getting it to human, and they don't, they don't interfere with that, apparently. Uh, there's a change at 452 L452M. This has appeared, they say, in at least one mink farm outbreak. There's no effect on, on binding. So this is not an adaptation um, to uh, interacting with the spike. So um, each of these adaptations, each of these amino acid changes are close to residues that differ between human and mustelid ACE2, which has been gleaned from modeling uh, of the interface. Okay, so just to repeat, Y453F, N501T, F486L, and the cluster 5 spike, which in addition has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's got other changes in addition. They all allow the pseudoviruses to enter human or ferret, but not rat. Uh, ACE2 cells with greater efficiency. And this, um, I mean, in this figure, what, figure three we're on now, yeah. um, it's interesting that this is probably not the whole story of what's selecting these mutations because it, the, the 453F, the 486, and the 501T all basically, from what I can see, provide the same amount of boost in spike binding and entry. Um, and yeah. the cluster five is maybe a little bit better which doesn't seem like the result you're getting from the infection studies where some of these, like the 501T, doesn't do nearly as well as the 453. Um, so there's probably more going on here. 
And they don't affect human ACE2 interaction. Right. It's interesting, right? I mean, they improve ferret, but they don't negatively affect human. Yeah, right? that's interesting. But, you know, this is just binding and entry, right? That's, yes. Right. As you say, there, there are likely other things going on as well. Um, okay. So then the next thing they did, um, how does Y453 affect the virus re reproduction in the in the human airway epithelium? So we've seen that it doesn't impact binding apparently, but what about a total infection? So they take primary bron human bronchial cells and they culture them in an air-liquid interface. So what they do, they take bits of bronchial tissue from people uh, and they disperse single cells and they put them on a membrane in a culture dish and the membrane has has uh, medium below it and above it and the cells get confluent and then when they get confluent they take the medium off the top but leave it on the bottom to feed the cells and now the cells are in the air which is their normal milieu in your tract and they differentiate into all the different cells of the uh, respiratory tract it's very cool I mean, like the ciliated cells, the mucus producing cells and so forth. And then you can infect them. That's air liquid interface. So it's a lung on so a they, plate, basically. It's a lung on a plate. <laughs> you know, the saying coughing up a lung. Yes. Well, there, there it is. So then they, they infect them with a mix of parental and ferret P2 viruses. Remember that's passage virus from that original experiment, which has Y453F. Low multiplicity of infection, 0 0.1. So very few cells are infected. Uh, so somehow, where did you get that? Because this was a major thing of mine, was what the multiplicity of infection was. It's right in the text there on page four. Good. Yeah. Right okay. column. Thank yeah. you. I missed that because that's important. At a low multiplicity of infection, you can't differentiate between spread and the actual replication in an individual cell. Mm -hmm. Right. As a matter of fact, you may be looking mostly at spread. Because you're looking at multiple you're looking at multiple rounds of infection. Multiple rounds of infection. In a high yeah. multiplicity of infection, you're looking at a single step. Right. Because all the cells are and most so of the cells so they, infected at once. They, this is yeah, very few cells are initially infected. And they take time points, 24, 48, 72 hours uh, post infection. That's gonna be figure four if you're following along. And Another plus in their favor, they have a zero time point. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> we are proponents of the zero time point here. <laughs> and I like the way this is set up where you got both viruses in the same experiment. Yes. Okay. So you're looking at a competition. I don't know how much of a competition it is in, other, in, that, in that I don't know if there's, you know, um, uh, co-infected cells that probably are towards the end. I don't know. Uh, but at least you got the two viruses in the same experiment. And there, in particular, that time zero point is important because you want to know what the ratio is yes. in, the, in the initial infection. Yeah, this is a fair yeah. fight. They yeah. they actually have a pretty good yeah. Yeah. mix in the beginning. And so the wild type wins the race. Um, less than 5% of reads at 48 hours, they, they do some sequencing to quantify. Less than 5% of reads contained Y453F because when you mix the two viruses, the only way you can say how much of one or the other is the sequence, the output, right? Because <laughs> you don't have any other way of uh, telling that telling them apart. I mean, these are uh, these are bona fide, um, are these bona fide SARS-CoV-2 or are these lentiviruses? No, yeah, I it's, think this is- bona fide, yeah. Yeah, this is the real deal. I mean, if one made- tiny plaques you could use that maybe but they don't they just sequence them which is <laughs> yeah just sequence the yield <laughs> don't do a plaque assay just sequence it so wild type wins it outcompetes y453f in human cells all right all right so but the most prominent uh, spillover from mink was this cluster five right which had in addition to Y453 has D614G and a deletion of amino acids 69 and 70, which has also come up in some other variants of concern. Right. And so there was concern at the time that this was going to be <clears throat> the source of the new variant of concern, that it was going to spill back into humans yeah. and do really well in humans. So they did another competition with that virus, 40% cluster 5, 60% uh, 
wild type. It's an early D614G containing virus. And again, uh, Y453F is outcompeted. Only 10% of reads by 24 hours. All right. And then um, one more interesting experiment. They made two isogenic viruses on a backbone of Wuhan isolate. Uh, both have D614G. Uh, they have um, Y453F. So you have D614G with Y453F or D614G alone. Just to rule out any of these other changes. And again, the uh, Y453F vi containing virus um, lost the race in this competition. So uh, this is not fit. We would say Y453F <laughs> containing viruses are simply not fit to compete with uh, ancestral viruses. They are not well adapted to human lung tissue no. in this in vitro Which system. It's interesting that 4,000 humans were still infected with a sure. poorly fit virus. That tells you a lot. Well, it only it? had to be fit enough to infect them. It didn't have to outcompete any other virus. Yeah, but it, did, it didn't didn't spread around the world. No. It eventually fizzled out. So that's the, but I just want to put it in the context of, you know, a poorly fit virus can do, still do something. Right. Right. 4,000 people is nothing to sniff at. As it were. As it were. Since we're talking yes. about nasal epithelium. <laughs> ah, <laughs> so was, I didn't think I, of that. I, I, I'm sitting here. Look, uh, did you look up where, uh, where they got these cultures? Uh, the the uh, airway liquid interfaces. Yeah. No, where'd there's, they get them? There's a company. Oh yes, you can buy this stuff. called oh, Epithelix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and I think you can. It looks to me like you can buy the cultures established. Oh wow! You probably. Uh, uh, um, you mean already with air liquid interface? Well, no. I think my uh, I'm I'm making this up, but my guess is that they would have to be transported, immersed, right, and that the instructions would be to suck yeah. off some of that stuff to create the uh, air interface. But uh, you can get um, uh, you can get them from healthy donors or from yeah. uh, COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, oh, can, allergic rhinitis, smoker. You can get different pathologies. You can pick your nose. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. This is great. Excellent. Do they have animal, no, animal ones? No, they that you can get. Uh, I don't know. Oh. I'm looking, you know, I'm just so, uh, yeah, we're browsing here, now, yeah. as it were. Yeah, they and, they got, and they got cool pictures of what they look like. You can also, so that's a great resource. Of course, they're not cheap, I have to tell you. I would, okay, I would you need to have money. Not, yeah. But you can also make these cells from induced pluripotent stem cells. Right. Mm -hmm. You can differentiate those to become whatever you want. One of them is, uh, is an airway. Which would be useful here. if you wanted some specific type of patient sample from an individual, right? Yeah, yeah. You take somatic cells, you make them pluripotent, right? And yeah. then differentiate them. All right, what about uh, antigenicity? Does Y453 affect antibody neutralization? So they Does have- it make it a new serotype? Oh, no. Make it a new <laughs> <laughs> They have convalescent first wave antisera. First wave. Wow. Uh, in fact- the, the why 453F is more easily neutralized with that sera compared to wild type. You need less antisera to get a 50% neutralization titer. And they used antisera from healthcare workers who had gotten uh, two doses of uh, Pfizer vaccine and same result. Uh, it's it's actually pretty good at neutralizing, better at neutralizing in Y5, 453 than wild type. Uh, then they did, uh, and these are virus, bona fide virus, SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Then they did some neutralizations with pseudoviruses, first wave convalescent sera. Uh, they have a lentivirus with the spike from either uh, the Y453 or the cluster five changes, all of those. Um, and the, as a control here, they have the beta spike. And that's got a, you see a drop in neutralization capacity uh, with that with that spike, a five-fold drop with pseudoviruses bearing that spike. And we knew this, this is like a control. Um, none of the 
uh, mink slash ferret adaptations had any significant impact on uh, reactivity with the Sanicera. So that's good. So nothing to fear. So far. So far. But I mean, who knows what the future yeah, portends, that's right? right. All right. So now, uh, as you know, these variants. Well, we know of what concern. the fu- what the future was for those um, those mink. Yeah, those, we do. Oh, know that. Yeah. So, as you know, um, some of the variants of concern have changes in the receptor binding domain. They include L four five two R E four eight four K and N five zero one Y, and they're thought to promote ACE two binding. So they ask, um, could these variants infect mink or ferrets? And this is interesting because if you remember, some of them infect mice, right? Right. They have gained the ability to infect mice. So what about ferrets? And as we, as you know, ferrets are not mice, <laughs> neither are mink. Um, nearly all variants tested. So let's see, what did they test? Um, Cluster five, alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, eta, iota. Iota. And this must be pre-Omicron. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, it might be pre-Delta. I don't see Delta yeah. in here. As we said, these studies take time. Yes. Neither all of these could better use mink ACE2 than wild-type pseudovirus. So just like with the mouse where some of them can infect mice, apparently all of these can, at least in a pseudovirus context, can get you into. So they say not, not all the, multiple yeah, variants. Not all the differences were significant. So beta and gamma are pretty similar to wild-type and getting into the... Yeah. Yeah, that's into right. The the weasel cells, right? Yep. Uh, Ada, Ada and Iota <laughs> did better, and that was significant. But Ada and Iota kind of didn't do so well in the competition against Delta and and Omicron, right? Well, and, and this is balanced against um, uh, mm. the fact that we've already seen that some of the at least one of these changes leaves you with. Uh, reactivity with serum that's yeah. even stronger and uh and in uh the airway cells there apparently is a fitness cost okay? right yeah. whether that's whether that's receptor binding or some other phenomenon uh, can't really be sure but so these may arise they may uh but they aren't necessarily going to be positively selected over you know a long period of time but the point is, is that some of these variants, I mean, really the key now is Omicron because that's what's around, right? And they didn't look at it. If Omicron could infect mink without any adaptation, then you could have another spillover into mink. But Does Omicron have N501Y? I think it does, yeah. We could find that out very easily. Let's take a look. Let's go to covariance.org. And we're going to select Omicron. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, so many changes. N five hundred one Y. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and what's the uh, what's the other prominent one? E four eight four K. It's got E four eight four A, not K. What other one are you looking for? Uh, y four five three. No, and let me see. Uh, the, I'm looking back at uh, figure. Right. I'm getting confused here. Figure two here, and the mutations they were considering was Y453F and N501T. Hmm. Uh, 453, we don't have any changes in Omicron, but 501, we have N501Y. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, may, the, the, so, I don't know what the situation with Omicron is with respect to mink. Right. But these other variants could infect mink and they don't have to get Y453Y. All right, so Y453Y appears to be selected in mink for ACE2 binding. Uh, the antigenicity is not impacted by that change and it's less fit in human bronchial epithelial cells. And they say this is probably why after we killed all the mink in Denmark, that was the end because there's no further source right, right. of spillback and the people didn't efficiently transmit it to yeah. each other, right? Well, so that's good because if SARS-CoV-2 in humans, it would keep going, right? 
Right. Even if you, if you got rid of the source, that's what it's doing. But uh, I think um, you, you have to be careful with the mustelids, right? Because you can still get outbreaks. I, I assume now on whatever mink farms that are left, I don't think there are any more left in Denmark, no. right? And probably Netherlands as no, well. No, well, De Denmark um, and I think Netherlands, I think there's an EU-wide, there was a plan to phase out mink farming by 2021 or something, and this just yeah. drastically accelerated it. Well, you have to, I mean, everybody who works there has to be tested. Right. Right? And and if you're positive, you can't work with the animals because you'll infect them. So that probably is effective, I, I assume. Right? Depending and on vaccinated. how frequently the testing is done and and how yeah. close the, the regulations are followed in different countries. I mean, there were a bunch of countries listed in this paper as having active mink farming, so. So they say that this Y453, we don't see it in people, even though it improves binding to ACE2, and they say maybe it's got some other effects that negate that, and that may be right. why. Uh, here's another thing I, I found here that's interesting. Um, the vast majority of sequences, f mink origin, are still from 2020 even though there are a number of ongoing mink outbreaks reported in Europe as, as of the writing of this paper. So there's a big reporting lag, apparently, of mink sequences. None of the four WHO-designated variants of concern have yet been associated with mink farm outbreaks. So what's the, what's the bottom line? You have to survey farmed mink, sequence any genomes you get, and check them. Because, you know, just because Y453 isn't fit for us doesn't mean that another change won't come up that's yeah. going to be fit. So you need to be vigilant. You need to do surveillance of not just people. Yes. Uh, throughout reading this, I was thinking about the paper that we did a while ago that was debating the origins of Omicron and hypothesizing mm -hmm. a mouse origin. Yeah. That's right. And I remember thinking as I was reading that paper and we talked about it with Nels that, you know, I was kind of skeptical. But here's an example of, you know, spill over into an animal and spill back into humans. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And the I mean, so, spill back brought the same, brought some of the changes that had been adaptive in the animal. Yeah. Although in yeah. this particular case, it didn't catch on. But maybe in the Omicron case, if you spill into the right species of mouse and you get the right set of mutations and it spills back into humans, that could be a source. Yeah. Right. Um, so you can't can't ignore that possibility. Yeah. And I would also add that predictions of outcomes are futile. <laughs> 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 right. So this mink didn't go anywhere in people, but Omicron, if it did come from mice, it went somewhere. Yeah. And this very clearly illustrates you've got a lot of spill over and back between humans and mink, um, possibly between humans and ferrets kept as pets. Um, and, and so yeah. in this in this set of experiments, the mutations that they saw from the mink, mink farm outbreaks were not adaptive to humans. But if you keep doing this long enough, maybe you'll eventually hit the right button. Yeah. I'm just very interested to see what other wildlife gets yes. infected, and you know we know deer and mice. It's almost getting to the point where I'm, I'm going to kind of kind of wondering what wildlife doesn't get infected. I am. You know, it's to, I mean, I, every time somebody I'm, looks, they find the thing with deer was really impressive, striking. Yeah, yeah. I, we haven't heard much about that though since that initial report. Right? There was I saw one additional paper that basically showed the same thing that it's. Widespread in deer. Widespread. Yep. I'm sure we'll hear more about that yeah. as the papers come out. Okay. Let's do a couple of emails. We haven't done email in a few episodes. Yeah. Uh, Alan, can you take that first one? Uh, let's see. So this is from Jerry. 20 Fahrenheit and Sunny in Arbutus, Maryland. He helpfully provides the um, pronunciation of Arbutus, but <laughs> I know how to pronounce Arbutus, hon. Um I took your virology course plus a couple of courses on epidemiology and immunology some years ago in Coursera. Never imagined that I'd need the virology or epidemiology. Took them because they looked interesting. Immunology I needed as I had developed an allergy to cats. 
read Janeway, read Janeway cover to cover several times as well. Fast forward, and these are the subjects of greatest use to me in the last two years. I am also old enough to remember polio epidemics. Until the seventh grade, there were kids in my school and sometimes classroom with leg braces and crutches. Anyway, I had a good idea of what was coming by early March 2020. However, talking to others about it was like talking to a wall, except walls don't talk back. I recognized early that the pushback was on the lo logical level of arguing about what color canaries you can grow if you plant bird seed. Focused instead <laughs> on taking care of my health and started walking eight miles a day for fitness, about the only risk variable I had control over. Having worked in biomedical research labs for 40 plus years, contamination control was second nature. I decided to refresh my understanding of virology and went looking for the course again, and it wasn't on Coursera anymore. Not hard to discover where it had migrated to, so pick up again from the start. A lot had changed, and a lot was still the same. In the process, I discovered Brianne's immunology course and the weekend at clinical updates with Daniel Griffin. The result was that last fall, I suspended my streaming TV service temporarily because I didn't have time to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Brianne, I know where Camden, New York is. Been through it many times on the way to Osceola via Florence for cross-country skiing. Philatelists should also know the location, but have never been there. I now hang out in Lake Placid during winter. Philatelists, Camden, New York. I don't know what the significance is there. Um, background, PhD in zoology and worked in wildlife research until financial issues dictated a career change to single channel patch clamp recording as a postdoc in Ithaca, New York. The change came about because I had electronics training in the army before college and was stood up for a lunch date in Carbondale, Illinois shortly before graduating. Story of another time. <laughs> Okay, further down the career path, I moved to a lab studying cystic fibrosis. Here we spent time studying a truncated form of the CFTR gene as a candidate for gene therapy. The issue was that the whole gene was too large to fit into the AAV5 vector, and uh, there are PubMed papers cited for both of these paragraphs. Anyway, refreshing to be hanging out with the cutting edge again. Keep podcasting, Jerry. And uh, you added a couple of... So, uh, Arbutus... Whenever I hear Arbutus, I think of the famous Abbott and Costello episode uh, where they're – anyway, there's a plant called the trailing Arbutus, Epi, Epigea repens, okay? And there's episode of Abbott and Costello, and I put the YouTube to it there. He's trying to clean up their garden, and he's pulling on this vine, and he just keeps pulling and pulling, and it never ends, and – uh Abbott says, what are you doing? Why don't you get it? He says, it's a trailing Arbutus. I can't clean. I'll never forget that. I saw that as a kid. And every time I see Arbutus, I think of the trailing, the trailing Arbutus. Arbutus. There you go. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Glenn writes, hi, Vincent and TWIV team. I am one of those who started watching TWIV when SARS-CoV-2 first started circulating. Precisely mid-January 2020 when China shut down Wuhan, I looked for information on virus and found Virology 2020. It was fascinating to watch your lectures as the virus was spreading across the world. That led to TWIV. I have to say that I understand maybe 40% and can make sense out of another 30%. Well, you're doing pretty yeah. well. Anyway, I love your Q&A with Amy as well. I debated over a week on whether or not to send an email. First, I thought TWIF 858 was very interesting, and the emails from listeners hit the spot. Watching TWIF for facts and trusted people who have been on uh, TWIF. I say to my friends, I rather listen to, so I'd rather listen to someone with 40 years in virology than someone with 40 years in politics. <laughs> this email about trusting TWIF guests was what triggered my email. There was an article about a prominent scientist who secretly believed in the lab leak hypothesis. I was curious uh, about who it could be, so I looked it up. Normally, I don't read articles on lab leak theory. The person quoted in a private email was Robert Gary. I was shocked because he was the first virologist I found who, dis who disputed the lab leak theory a year ago. And I saw him on TWIV as well. By the end of the day, the article disappeared. I assume he cha disappeared. I assumed he challenged the news organization and they pulled the article anyway. I was wondering if you or the other TWIV team knew any more. I don't. 
This lab leak theory is getting out of hand. I appreciate when, uh, do you have, I don't know when the date is on this because I've been thinking lately that the lab leak theory um, lately, um, thankfully, is a bit Seems of, to have faded from the prominent. headlines, yes. Yes. At any rate, this, it, at times it has been out of hand. This lab leak theory is getting out of hand. I appreciate Twiv has already addressed it multiple times, but the media keeps saying scientists are now talking about it without naming any scientists except for one in Australia. I know you and the team don't like covering this over and over again, but I think it's important for scientists to speak out. Then it triggered another thought. And again, this is uh, the Twiv episode. And again, <clears throat> I don't think you uh, will cover it because it's tricky. Fort Detrick. There was a lab leak there in August 2019, and there is a line, a very thin line to <laughs> Wuhan. I looked it up uh, in April of 2020 when rumor was that China was blaming the U.S. for a lab leak that caused um, the outbreak in Wuhan. A thin line. I won't go over the details, but I was interested if you and or others on TWIV team know any more. Since you know the work in Wuhan, how much do you know about the work at Fort Detrick? While uh, they accuse Wuhan lab allegedly of having ties to Chinese military, Fort Detrick uh, is the U.S. military. I believe much of the work there is classified. There is a there is documented history on the Fort Detrick that Fort Detrick did bioweapon research. I also found a list of viruses that Fort Detrick worked on. The list does not confirm which is active because that is classified. To my surprise, coronavirus was not on the list. I suspect you talked about it, but I thought I'd ask anyway. Likely, you will get kicked <laughs> off YouTube. I was just curious. So we haven't really, I, I've, this is the first I've heard about that particular uh, line of thought. Fort Detrick, yeah, had a history in bioweapons research a long time ago. It, that was that was shut, the bioweapons or biodefense or bio whatever research was shut down in the 60s. Well, right? you will a, find that they, ban on bioweapons they come up a lot in discussions of the am amerithrax uh, anthrax attacks. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, okay. People can look that uh, but up. But Fort, Fort Detrick, you know, has the advantage of having facilities to uh, uh, study pathogens of high consequence. Yes, they do. Uh, but but let's just make it clear. Nobody had an ancestral SARS-CoV-2 to work on. No. So there's no right. thin line from right. Fort no. Detrick to Wuhan. Right. That's just nonsense. Right. I have become a fan. Thank, thanks for your work, and I really appreciate the conversation and discussion on virology. I learned something that is related to Rich's uh, uh, pick in the TWIV, the Zamboni. Alan may know this. I heard where the uh, term hoser comes from. It is one of the great Canadian terms. Hoser came from uh, pickup hockey in areas where there are open rinks. I lived in Montreal for a short time, so I know what they're like. Hosers are losers who have to hose down the rink after the game. A human Zamboni means a loser. <laughs> anyway, for me, I would like to hear about Fort Detrick and hope uh, real scientists get together and speak out on this lab leak theory. I saw a TWIV 760 with the team from the WHO investigation team. It is sad because of the lab leak accusation. I think China's door will be shut for further investigation. I think this pandemic can be called the political pandemic. <laughs> well, you mix uh, politics and science, you get you politics, get politics yes. right? Uh, one other interesting thought. Last week, $130 million, million was dumped into the South China Sea. <laughs> what kind of research can you do for $135 million? I saw one F-35 that fell off an air aircraft carrier. It's sad to see the government's priorities. Anyway, sorry for the long-winded email. Again, like many of your listeners, I really appreciate you and the TWIV team's work. All the best. Maybe you can ask the government to donate a uh, F-35 <laughs> for your research. <laughs> Cheers, Glenn. Yeah, I, just so, wanna, uh, I just want to use it for a quick flight before we <laughs> sell it. Then, then we can. Uh, we we talk about this occasionally, the equivalence yes. uh, between grants and cruise missiles, right? Did, a, did an F-1 or F-35 fall in the sea? Apparently. Is that right? I, I guess yeah, so. I hadn't really followed that news, but it uh, sounds like yeah, somebody that's a, had an accident. That's more, than, that's more than a grant. That's a consortium. Yes. Okay. Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, yeah, happily, the uh, lab leak theory seems to have, seems to be, you know, 
dormant uh, out of uh, uh, dormant <laughs> yes. a good word dormant uh for for a time and it seems to me you know the most recent uh uh sort of resurgence of that i read some of the material and it's you know there's there's no facts no it's 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 uh people it's basically gossip yes who said what about it's who? gossip and innuendo okay. yeah and uh so and i you know as we've said so many times, science is self-correcting, and I think there's just not enough fact to sustain this over uh, a long period of time. So glad it's subsided for the time being. Mm, all right. Adam writes, I noticed several studies regarding a different version of an mRNA vaccine relative to the original one developed by Moderna and Bi Pfizer-BioNTech. One such study is here, and Adam gives a link to a Lancet paper. Here's a relevant passage from this article. CVN-CoV is a chemically unmodified, unmodified mRNA vaccine candidate based on the RNA-active mRNA vaccine platform encoding the stabilized full-length native SARS-CoV-2 spike of SARS-CoV-2 wild type. The mRNA is protected by lipid nanoparticles used for delivery. Given what was discussed from the Carrico and Weissman Immunity 2005 article in the last episode of TWIV, I'm wondering how an unmodified mRNA platform can be used. It's not clear to me. Wouldn't this be toxic to the host animal because the RNA does not contain modified bases such as pseudouridine? This recent article is also relevant. Adam is a, a professor of biology at uh, Albright College. So this, <laughs> okay, here's the story. So this is a randomized trial for... Uh, this, this vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, using unmodified uh, mRNA. So they enrolled uh, 40,000 participants and they have control in vaccine groups. And here are the results. Uh, overall vaccine efficacy against symptomatic COVID, 48%. I don't have to tell you more. The last sentence, we have made the decision to cease activities on this vaccine candidate. So if you don't modify the bases... It doesn't, it doesn't work. work. Yeah. I wouldn't expect it to be toxic. No. Just not very active. Yeah. I mean, why would you even do it in the first place? <laughs> right? Because you know, know the, the RNA is going to be eliminated by uh, innate responses. And you're going to, I don't know why they would do it. Maybe they thought they would get around the patent issues, right? Yeah. So RNA active technology, this is somebody's, um, this is somebody's pet uh, that's RNA active with a registered trademark in a circle. Um, and CureVac licensed that from Sanofi. Uh, I don't know whose it was originally. Mm. Um, but I think the point of the study was to test this particular brand basically this, yeah. this yeah. platform that they were hoping would be good for vaccine development. Um, and in this particular case, it's not as good as. Didn't work. Yeah. I mean, well, so it didn't the work. I mean, 48% is not zero, but 48% no. sucks by the standards that we're now accustomed oh, yeah. to. So in the U S that wouldn't have been approved. No, it was less than it was 50%. Less than 50% right? Yeah. So well, the you know, it's good to have the data. Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. It's unfortunate that they went through 40,000 people with, yeah. it's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and those people will have to be revaccinated, most likely. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nature article that Adam sent is uh, from Dan Baruch's lab, optimization of non-coding region for a non-modified mRNA. So they say that if you modify the non-coding region, you can do better in, in non-human primates, right? But I think... You should just forget it. Just go with the mo modified bases and, yeah. you know, t take a license out if you want to make a bloody vaccine. Well, I, it. um, it's important to note that there was a lot of work on mRNA vaccines at different companies using different approaches over the years. And a lot of this stuff was in, was in a state of, gee, this might work at the time the pandemic started. Yeah. And um, that's true. So, you know, in retrospect, yeah, these platforms aren't nearly as good as the ones we got. Um, but that's just because Moderna and, and Pfizer happened to have the right answer 
Um, it didn't have to be that yeah. way. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's fine to try and fix it, right? Yeah. There's this non-coding region. All right, maybe that'll fix it. But uh, so you don't want to say leave it alone because you never know what's going to turn out making yes. it work, right? So it's fine. Yeah. So it's good to it's good to do these <clears throat> projects, and these were all things that people that people these were all shots on goal and they didn't all hit. Yeah. All right. Time for some picks of the week. Rich, what do you have for us today? Uh, I don't know if this has been picked before, but I couldn't find it. It's on my list <laughs> to read, but I hadn't picked it because I hadn't read it yet. So this is a book by Paul Offit called Vaccinated, One Man's Quest to Defeat the World's Deadliest Diseases. Um, it was published in 2009, I believe. Um, so it's not new. It's one of his uh, earlier books. It's, uh, I, I um, confess that it is the first uh, Paul Offit, Offit book that I have read. And it is essentially a biography of Maurice Hilleman. Hilleman. And I should, uh, who we've discussed before, uh, was the developer of numerous vaccines, um, yeah. including... Uh, what he had a hand in uh, uh, measles. Uh, he did mumps from scratch. Uh, I forget what else. Uh, several. There's about seven. Okay, as, as Offit points out uh, in this, he's probably uh, responsible as a single individual for saving more lives uh, in this century, or maybe ever, than any other uh, health professional yeah. ever. Um, well, I, I, in fact, I, think, I think the only person who might compete on that score would be Norman Borlaug, who was not a health professional. Uh, who was Norman he was, Borlaug? Sorry. He was an agricultural researcher. Ah, okay. So at any rate, uh, this is uh, at its core a biography of Maurice Hilleman, but it's more than that. Oh, and I should say that interestingly, and I, I'm going to have an opportunity to interact with uh, Offit um, later this week. Um, uh, and I need to ask him about this. Um, uh, in his preface to this, he said that, so off, um, Hilleman was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at about age 84. So he had some, uh, time to contemplate his demise. And apparently, uh, Offit interviewed him extensively during that time. I did too. Okay. I don't, I, yeah, Alan oh, did. You did yeah, too. I, okay. I, my um, profile of him in Nature Medicine was the last, like, news article profile of him. Okay, uh, and very I, interesting. I conducted a, what I believe was probably the last press interview with him. Okay. Um, it was right after uh, they, so they held, and and I guess Paul was either working on this book then, um, or had, maybe he'd written it already and I wasn't aware of it, but... Um, <clears throat> At that time, um, right as he'd been diagnosed and he knew things were going to end, um, Offit and some other folks organized a big, um, a big symposium in his honor mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, and I went to that. Um, and it was a, it was an amazing event. It was a who's who of vaccinology. I mean, I was, I'll bet. I was sitting there with, uh, with Kaprowski and uh, all these, <laughs> all these <laughs> folks and, uh, and Tony Fauci was there and just everybody was, uh, and great talks. It was a uh, good seminars. So, uh, this book, I, uh, I also confess I haven't finished it yet. Okay, but I'm uh, far enough through it so that I know uh, what the structure is and can uh, recommend it. Uh, the sort of uh, underlying or overlaying the Hilleman biography is a lot of history of vaccinology and history of viruses. Because, uh, for example, you know, he talks about developing a, uh, a vaccine by uh, serial passage in non-human cells in culture and how that attenuates things. And then he spins off into the whole history of how that concept evolved. Okay. Likewise, inactivation of viruses and et cetera. So it's much more than just a biography of uh, Hilleman. It's a it's a sort of a history of vaccinology, and it's a it's a great read. He writes really well. Yeah, okay? he does. So I really enjoy writer. this. At any rate, I recommend. Yeah, and and yeah, Hilleman had an amazing life. <laughs> yeah, 
Did you interview him in person, Alan? Uh, I talked to him in person and on the, on the phone afterward. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, there was a I, lot that I couldn't quote from the interview. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Anybody who's met him would understand. He had yeah. a very, yeah, very direct way of person. speaking. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I can't believe this wasn't a pick at some point, yeah. but I can't well, find it either. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, you used to, uh, you used to keep track of picks. I know. Yeah, I and, stopped. And, and as I say, somehow and, it ended up on my library list, and I it must have been either I saw I saw it somewhere. I don't know if it was a pick. I found I can usually figure out whether something has been picked before by searching, you know, TWIV, Twiv vaccinated, yes, right? You know, yeah. Uh, but I couldn't, I, or TWIV off it vaccinated or whatever. And I couldn't find this. Yeah, I was surprised as well. So the last pick. <laughs> was 506 that I had listed. So ah. uh, it should be on this list because it would have been before then. Hmm. Um, vaccines in your child, vaccines course, autism's false prophets. Yep. Yeah, yeah, vaccines in your child, TWIV 127. <laughs> Is that it? No, that's not it. Sorry. No, no. I'm very sorry. Vaccinated by Paul Offit. And I think maybe somebody picked it, right? his, yeah. his latest, which Twiv is You Bet Your Life. Yeah. yeah, but TWIV yeah. number 33. Wow. Um, that is an old TWIV that is with an old Alan TWIV. Dixon, me, and Raul Rabadon. Hmm. Holy cow. Yeah, 33 is uh, pre-condit. Yeah. Holy cow. Look at how old they are. My gosh. <sighs> but that's fine. You can pick it again because it's a great book. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there are out there uh, worthy repicks. Yes. Yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a little quiz that you can take um, to find out which immune cell you are. <laughs> uh, this is uh, by a company called Stem Cell Technologies, and it's just a cute little quiz with nifty artwork and and uh, very amusing summaries when you get to the end of it. And there's also uh, my other link here is an article um, on the NPR website by Michaeline Duclef, Um about uh, about the quiz, um, and uh, she has some summaries of a few of the common cells that you might end up as. I took this a while ago, and I think I came out as a natural killer. I cell. also came out as a natural killer. Cell. <laughs> it surprised me a little bit, but yeah. All right, I'm taking. It. I want to see what kind of okay. cell I am. What is your least favorite favorite part of lab work? Um. Finding out that my cells have died, yes. Yeah, that was me. What's your favorite lab technique? Well, they don't have they don't black as they listed. So I guess tissue culture, I'll put yeah. that down. That's me too, uh, you're going to be a natural killer cell. Show man. my outcome. I'm a helper T cell. Ah, okay. <laughs> oh. Trustworthy, Isn't dependable, nice? and great at motivating others. Isn't that That's nice? sweet. Your colleagues and friends know that they can always come to you for help, especially if they need help finding inspiration. Okay, <clears throat> that's right. pretty cool. Yeah, go with that. That's good. Um, and then there's Michael Lean's article about yes. it, right, Alan? Yeah, yeah. that's uh, okay. Good. Uh, my pick is a is a video I just released, which is an interview with David Molesky, who's the artist who made uh, this painting that I acquired uh, here, Ebola, uh, Ebola, which uh, I've talked about before and I shared with everybody, but. Um, and is now hanging on the wall behind me in the next room. Uh, the, David came by in January, and we sat in front of the painting, and he talked about, you know, how he became an artist and uh, what inspired him to do the painting. And the painting so, is big, uh, so you were seated at an appropriate distance for. Yeah, uh, it's um, <laughs> you know, I put I I did the interview with, the, with nobody else here but David, so I set up a I set up two cameras. I set up one which would get both of us sitting on either side of the painting. And I had, to, the thing, the, the image has distortion because it's so wide right. that you know how a wide lens has some distortion anyway. And then I put a camera on David only so that when he was talking, which he did most, which was most of the episode, um, uh, it, the camera was on him. And then David Renata, uh, my video editor, did the, the final edits and he put, Lots of cool things in it. Uh, and I love the opening. The opening is really well done. It's based on uh, Fred Murphy's, Murphy's original EM um, of the virus that 
inspired uh, David. He went to the library at Berkeley uh, where he was a college student and um, he found this electron micrograph and he decided to make that the, the focus of the painting. The other cool part is that the right hand side used to be a sep used to be more it used to be bigger the painting was wide and his art teacher at berkeley said nah it's i think he had an hiv particle on the right so he cut it off <laughs> and he sold the right hand part at an age benefit he said he made more money than he ever <laughs> had <laughs> <laughs> and I, he sent me a photo of that and and uh, david uh, attached the two of them so you could see what the oh, original cool. painting was like so it's very good and you hear you know, what inspired him to do this. And um, now he's interested in viruses. He wants to uh, <laughs> do more virus paintings, which is good. Very good. Ebola on canvas. And we have a listener pick from Leo. Hello, Vincent and everyone on the TWIV crew. First, huge thank you for all the information and communication you're doing to help us non-scientists during these interesting times. I found you shortly after the lockdown started here in Prague in March, 2020. I've been a listener since. I'm a 57-year-old ESL teacher with a history degree who was relying on a high school biology class and biology 101 class and a human sexuality class at Cal Poly Pomona to keep up with your wizardly banter. But you do a fantastic job of defining things as you go. Now, now what does this human sexuality have I was have wondering what that had to do with us. But by the way, this is less, <laughs> less, not Leo. Sorry, right. sorry, less. My pick is a science-based podcast known as Ologies by Ali Ward. She's a TV host and science communicator whose podcast has been around since early 2018, and each week features a different ologist in fields ranging from ancient yeasts to space junk and everything in between. I didn't know anything about hagfish, but after listening to that episode, I was quite fascinated by these marine animals. The podcast has a Facebook group with only almost 22,000 members. I have linked to TWIV several times in the group, so it's likely you have many ologites who listen to TWIV. I've taken the liberty to link shows for each of you below. I should also point out that unlike TWIV, Ologies isn't always family friendly with respect to language, although some of the listeners volunteer to provide both bleeped episodes and transcripts <laughs> for each episode. So for Vincent, uh, he provides a gastro-Egyptology episode, an episode that covers bread and yeasts, and making bread using yeasts discovered during some archaeological work in Egypt. For Rich, Space Archaeology, an episode that covers space junk with archaeologist Dr. Alice Gorman. Dixon gets Mycology, an episode that covers mushrooms with Dr. Tom Volk. Kathy, an episode that covers molecular biology and science communication with Dr. Raven Baxter, a.k.a. Raven the Science Maven. Alan, an episode that covers video and board games and why playing them is quite good for your mental health with Dr. <laughs> Jane McGonigal. Ludology, yes. And uh, for Amy, an episode that covers virology with a focus on COVID-19 with Dr. Shannon Bennett, Dr. Merlin Tuttle, Dr. Samantha Montano, and Dr. Evan Rumberger, who I must admit I have not heard of any of them. So I don't know if they are virologists. Cool. Thank you all again for the awesome podcast, Les. Thank you, Les. That's cool. Excellent. Excellent. Very good stuff. That'll do it for TWIV 871. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions, comments, uh, picks of the week to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, we'd love to have your financial support to keep this organization going, microbe.tv slash contribute. We're a 501c3. Your contributions, at least here in the U.S., are tax deductible. Alan Dove's at alandove.com. He's Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Alan is Twivite number three, <laughs> right? You joined yes, after right Dixon. right after Dixon. Rich Condit is Twivite number four. He's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I am Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral.